and yeah, I'm, uh, welcome to the session. Um, we're going to be talking about streamlining virtual machine creation, um, what myself and Felix have been working on now for about a year um, within Cubevert. Um, Felix is driving the presentation, so Felix, you can go to the next slide. Thank you very much. So brief introductions. Um, my name is Lee Yarwood. Um, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, been at Red Hat since um, 2009. Um, I joined the Qvert team within Red Hat um, last year at the beginning of 2022. Prior to that, um, I worked on OpenStack on the virtual compute team there for seven years. Um, and prior to that, I was in support um, for various different Red Hat products. Felix, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, Felix Matoschek, also software engineer at Red Hat. And I just joined last year in January. And since then, I've been working on uh, Kubert, the instance types, and uh, WordCTL. Cool. Um, if you get to the next slide, so the agenda for today, then, um, we're going to briefly touch on um, why uh, we were looking to streamline virtual machine creation and the goals that we initially set out with. Um, this is a 25 minute session. Um, it was originally supposed to be two different sessions, and we've kind of collapsed everything into one. So. Um, I've put in a quick TLDR, um, so if you take anything away, hopefully those three or so slides uh, will be useful. Um, we'll try and jump into um, some API and CRD changes that we've introduced and features we've introduced um, to help um, with virtual machine creation. Um, Felix will then introduce um, his Vert CTL work and improvements, um, and at the end, we'll briefly touch on uh, what's coming next. Uh, next slide, please, Felix. Um, as I said, it's a very short session. I'm going to probably be talking very quickly. Um, if you do have questions, obviously, we can potentially get to them at the end. Um, we do have a pretty extensive user guide documentation. Um, and at the bottom of most slides will be a link to that documentation and the relevant section within uh, for that topic. Um, if you can't find your answers in the user guide or if we don't have time at the end for questions, obviously, feel free to reach out to myself or Felix, and we'll do our best to answer your questions and probably follow up with a PR for the user guide as well if it isn't answered there correctly. Uh, next slide, please, Felix. OK, so why are we looking to do this? Um, for anyone that's had the um, opportunity to play around with Cuba and the virtual machine CRD in particular, uh, you'll appreciate that it's an extremely rich API and CRD, but ultimately, it's quite overwhelming for users. Um, most infrastructure as a service projects and or uh, public cloud providers already have a simplified creation process for their resources. Um, and two previous solutions to the problem within Cube are, are no longer really viable. Uh, this should say virtual machine instance presets. Um, so thank you, Brian, for um, including that example in the last presentation. Um, so virtual machine instance presets are now deprecated as, as of 057. Um, they were um, really a, a copy of a concept from Kubernetes that had previously been deprecated and actually removed from core Kubernetes, and thus the deprecation Kubevert. Um, downstream at Red Hat, we had um, a separate um, resource called Templates uh, that we'd introduced. It's really a downstreamism within Red Hat. It's not really applicable upstream, um, and it had its own issues. Um, I think we ended up with over 100 templates um, because of all the different connotations of the amount of resource you could have and the different runtime, um, the different workloads, sorry, that we were targeting as well. Um, so both of those no longer really viable. Uh, next slide, please. So the goals um, that we kind of initially set out with, obviously the easy one is simplifying virtual machine creation for users. Um, and we wanted to do this by reducing the user decision matrix when creating a virtual machine. Um, wanted to do this in a Qvert native and upstream first way. Um, and having separate resources to encapsulate workload resources and runtime preferences um, for, for the virtual machine. Next slide, please. So the TLDR is a wall of text, so apologies about that, but uh, there's quite a lot to get in here. Um, so what we've done is we've introduced two new families of CRDs, each family containing a namespace and cluster-wide CRD with a common spec shared between them. Uh, the first of the families is instance types um, that will define resource-related attributes of a virtual machine. Uh, the second family is preferences, and they define preferred values for the remaining runtime attributes of the virtual machine. We do go into a bit more detail later, so um, this is just the TLDR for now. Um, for both of these, only a single instance type and preference can be referenced by 
a virtual machine. So you get one of each, a selection of one of each um, per virtual machine. Uh, you don't have to select each. You can select one or the other um, or none at all and just have the normal virtual machine that you're always used to. Um, but yeah, that's the, the kind of mapping limitation that we have. Um, and uh, these are applied to and expanded within the virtual machine instance at runtime. So the virtual machine um, is, um, the virtual machine resource doesn't actually map to a running guest. The virtual machine instance resource maps to the running guest. Um, and we do all our expansion um, into that virtual machine instance at runtime. Um, so the virtual machine instance doesn't actually change at all. It is still the, the fully rich, um, very complicated <laughs> and uh, very strict implementation uh, for, for the guest at runtime. Uh, next slide, please, Felix. Just to kind of put a diagram up and try and simplify that a little bit. On the left-hand side, you'll see the two new families of CRDs that we've introduced. Um, we mapped them through to the virtual machine and they're expanded into the virtual machine instance on the right at runtime. We'll go into more detail about the instance type and preference matches in a second, but this is just a diagram. Um, so if you need to come back and uh, look at these, th these slides, this will hopefully um, give you an overview of what we're trying to do here. Next slide, please. Uh, this was supposed to illustrate just how much we can simplify things down um, as well with, with this approach. On the left-hand side is a Windows 10 virtual machine derived from a downstream Red Hat template um, with you know, lots of options enabled um, within the, the core um, virtual machine instance spec that's within the virtual machine. Um, on the right-hand side is um, the same guest, uh, same virtual machine. Um, but using a single instance type and a single preference to pretty much empty out the virtual machine instance spec, um, apart from things like domain spec and devices that have to be listed at the moment. Um, the majority of what remains is about storage. Um, so yeah, we could, with this new approach, um, hopefully we can eliminate um, a lot of the, uh, the complexity from at least the virtual machine um, and just allow users to, in this case, select you know, an instance type and a preference um, and various storage and networking decisions, and they should be good. Next slide, please. Okay, so just a quick overview of the um, API, the CRDs, and um, the, the features are kind of following on from this on the next slide. But um, the API was introduced in 056. It was actually renamed from Flavors. That was the original um, implementation within Kubeflow prior to me joining the team. Um, V1 Alpha 2 was then introduced in 0.58, um, and V1 Beta 1 will be coming in the next release of Qvert that is no longer 0.60. So in, by uh, V1, hopefully, uh, we will be introducing a V1 Beta 1 version of the API, hopefully denoting, denoting some stability with things as well. Um, the actual de de CRDs that we have um, at the moment, so the two families with a namespace that are cluster-wide uh, variant in both. So we have virtual machine instance type for the namespace variant of an instance type, the virtual machine cluster instance type for the cluster-wide variant, virtual machine preference for the namespace variant, and virtual machine cluster preference for, you guessed it, the cluster-wide variant. Next slide, please, Felix. So briefly touching um, on some examples and just each of those individual families. Uh, so on the right-hand side, you'll see an example, uh, virtual machine cluster instance type, very simple. Uh, there are more complicated examples available. I just wanted to give a, a very simple one. This, uh, this general purpose <laughs> um, inst instance type actually comes from the common instance type project that um, we'll talk about later on as well, but you can see it's uh, providing a single vCPU and four gigabyte, gigabytes of RAM. Um, the, yeah, just to reiterate again, instance types are um, used to um, encapsulate resource related attributes of virtual machine instance spec. Um, the, the key uh, thing to note with instance types is these are required values and they will conflict with user choices in the virtual machine. So taking the example on the right, if um, you reference an instance type from a virtual machine that already is requesting an amount of vCPU or an amount of RAM um, at mission time of the virtual machine, um, there will be a conflict and the request will be rejected. Um, if you use an instance type, um, the resources or the, the request within the instance type um, have to be um, have to be used and they will conflict with anything that you select in the VM outside of that. Um, 
and uh, yeah, and again, just to reiterate, a virtual machine can only reference one instance type. Next slide, please. Uh, virtual machine preference and virtual machine cluster preference. So it's pretty much all the remaining attributes of the virtual machine instance spec um, are encapsulated within the preference. Um, the big change here is that these are preferred values um, and they do not overwrite or conflict with user choices in virtual machine. So the example I typically give here, um, you'll see um, in the example there that we've got preferred disk bus. Um, so if you already have a virtual machine that has disks um, already um, assigned within the virtual machine and they have a particular bus associated with them, say SATA, um, using a preference and using this preference in particular where, where it has a preferred disk bus of vert.io, um, that will not um, overwrite or conflict with the user choice for the disk that is already using SATA. If there are any additional disks that don't have a bus associated with them, they'll get vert.io. Uh, but for anything that's existing in there, um, it, it won't overwrite or conflict. And again, you can only reference one at a time. Next slide, please. So to actually match to um, a virtual machine, we have um, instance type matcher and preference matcher. Um, the, the, these matches reside within the virtual machine spec. Um, and um, are required to take a name of the resource that you're matching to. Um, they can optionally take a kind. It defaults to the cluster-wide variants of both instance type and preference. Um, and there are some additional fields that are populated that we'll come on to talk to talk about in a second, the revision name and infer from volume. Um, key thing to note here is that there is no current support for cross namespace referencing. So when using the namespace variants, it is assumed that the resources, the instance type of the preference that you're pointing to reside in the same name as the virtual machine. Next slide, please, Felix. Okay, and this just um, is to illustrate, um, again, the um, where the complexity is kind of moved, moved to. So on the left-hand side is an example virtual machine where we are using cluster-wide um, instance types and preferences. Um, so the simple kind of um, virtual machine on the left is um, expanded into the kind of more complete virtual machine instance on the right-hand side at runtime. Uh, and that has actually been cut down a little bit, I've just noticed as well. So um, yeah, you can see that on the left, virtual machine stays nice and tidy. On the right, the virtual machine instance is still fully populated and rich as before. Next slide, please. Okay, so revision name, um, to um, ensure that things um, say, stay consistent with when using instance types and preferences, uh, we actually take a controller revision um, copy um, of either the instance type of the preference um, the first time that the virtual machine is seen by Cooper and specifically the virtual machine controller. Um, so this just avoids um, say if uh, you create a virtual machine and um, using the instance type at one moment and it has one vCPU assigned to it, for example, um, if someone was to come along and change the number of vCPUs provided by that instance type, um, by using this mechanism, we're ensuring that your original virtual virtual machine will always get one vCPU when it stops and starts and or it does whatever. Um, new virtual machines um, created from that instance type will pick up the new revision for the instance type and use whatever new value of CPUs you have, uh, but the original one will stay um, stay the same and yeah, using the controller revision mechanism. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so new in 059, we have a new feature called infer from volume. Uh, this takes the name of a volume listed in the virtual machine. Uh, it looks for the specific labels that we'll talk about in a second to determine the name and kind. Um, and as before, kind is optional. We default to the cluster word variant. Um, it looks at the underlying volume types. Um, so at the moment, data volume, data source, and PVC are all supported. Um, but failure to um, find an underlying volume um, or a volume listed in the VM or any of the labels, or well, the name label particularly, um, will cause the request to be rejected. This is the user opting in to use the feature. If we can't service the request, um, given the user opt opting in for it, then we reject the request. Next slide, please, Felix. And this is just a quick example to illustrate that. So on the left-hand side, there's an example virtual machine where we're using infer from volume uh, against the Fedora volume that maps into a data volume. We have a data volume template, and ultimately it's backed by a PVC. On the right is the PVC and the two, well, 
T labels that we'd expect to be listed there uh, when we're using it for an instance type and a preference, uh, just default instance type and default preference. Go to the next slide, please, VX. And this is what happened. So the virtual machine mutation webhook is responsible for carrying all of this out. Um, and it just rewrites the matcher to include the name um, and the default kind. Um, this has actually um, also been seen by, by the virtual machine controller. So the revision name is also populated here, but um, the, 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 the feature specifically only looks at the, the name and kind. Next slide, please, Felix. Final slide from me. So common instance types, um, as I kind of alluded to before, it's just a repository of um, hopefully useful uh, instance types and preferences um, for people looking to get started um, with instance types and preferences. Uh, it's a customized based repo. It's a really easy to play around with and edit. Um, provides 29 instance types and 28 preferences at the moment, both namespace and cluster wide. Um, yeah, at the moment, the preferences are targeting mostly operating systems. We do hope to kind of look at more specific workloads in the near future. Um, patches and PRs are obviously welcome. Um, and yeah, feel free to play around with it. And it's, yeah, hopefully a good starting point. And I think that's it from me. Is it Felix next? With uh, yes. Yes. yes, I'm next. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Lee, for giving an introduction to the uh, instance types and preferences. And I will show you the latest word CTL improvements now. So um, how do we make use of instance types and preferences? And uh, how, do they use, uh, how do they improve the user experience? So um, given a new API and CRDs, can we also provide a better CLI UX? Um, before we look at the word CTL improvements, let's have a look at other hyperscalers. So uh, what do others do? Well, uh, whether it's uh, GCP or uh, AWS, Azure or OpenStack, they all have very similar command lines. So usually you just need an image um, and that's that's enough to create a running instance. So everything else is uh, derived from the image. Um, so this makes for pretty short command lines. And um, now that we know what others do, how does it work in Kubeword again? Well, uh, as Lee already mentioned, you could use templates, but uh, problem there is that they are exclusive to OKD and OpenShift. So not usable on plain Kubernetes. And when you use templates, what you do essentially is you create a copy of the definition inside the template. So if you create one VM, you create a copy, create another VM, create another copy and so on and so on. You end up with a whole lot of copies. And let's say you wanted to, to improve your template, update it, change it. Uh, you have to update all your VMs manually. So that's not very maintenance friendly. And if you're using plain Kubernetes, well, then you have to copy everything anyways, because there's nothing like templates. So, Introducing with CTL create VM, uh, a way with cloning the same template definition over and over again. So this is a new subcommand to word CTL. And as its name says, um, it allows to create VMs. Uh, it's available starting with the version 0 0.59 release. And it provides a fixed set of CLI flags to adjust uh, the virtual machine parameters of the virtual machine to be created. So for example, you can set the name, you can specify a boot volume, and you can use instance type preferences. Um, this is just an opinionated starting point. So it's just a few flags, but those will be extended in the future. And what does it actually do? Well, it outputs manifest, which can be piped into kubectl or C. So I think this is really great because it's, it's very simple. It's just manifests and they're usable on Kubernetes and OKD OpenShift. So, um, this is a, a very upstream first way, I think. So uh, one other thing for um, making it really easy. Um, what does this comment have to do with instance types and preferences again? Well, Lee told you about the inference of uh, instance types and preferences. And this command is able to make use of this feature. So currently you still have to pass two additional flags in for instance type and for preference, as you can see here. And then you need one data source, uh, which has the appropriate labels. And that's enough to create a, a running VM, which has the appropriate settings for the guest. And once this feature is enabled by default, uh, it will allow for really easy, really short command lines that are comparable to the ones we just saw before from the other hyperscalers. So I think from a UX point, we are on a par there. And yeah, I think that's, that's really nice. So 
uh, about the usage of Boot City Equipium. So as I said, it has a, a lot of flags and um, here's an overview, but uh, please have a look at the documentation. It's way more detailed. I will give just a quick rundown. So as I said, you can specify name, you can use instance types, you can specify volumes and you can specify a cloud init data. Uh, about the volumes, so you can use container disks, uh, data sources, clone PVCs, PVCs and blanks. Um, so you can specify the volume flags multiple times and you will end up with a VM which has uh, multiple disks. Uh, just uh, please note, there's a fixed boot order and that's reflected in the order the flags appear here. So first come container disks, then data sources, then clone PVCs, PVCs and then blanks. Um, enough of the talk, uh, it's time for a demo. So what does happen if you run Word City Equate VM? So you can see uh, it's outputting a manifest and this manifest is, uh, it's very minimal, but it's, it's valid. So we could create a VM on the API with that, but it's not very useful. So let's say um, I wanted to add a, a PVC to that. So I run another command where I uh, pass the volume PVC flag. Just a second. So uh, here you can see uh, it added a volume to the VM this time. So it's uh, still a similar manifest, but with a volume uh, at the bottom. And you can see uh, the volume is called my PVC, and it's also using the, the, the PVC my PVC. So it's a bit more useful, but still not super useful. So uh, let's come back to the uh, inference of instance type uh, preferences. So. I, preferred, uh, I prepared a, a data source here. It's called Fedora. And we have a look at its labels and we can see it has the default instance type and default preference labels. And it suggests to use the N1 medium instance type and the Fedora preference. So uh, let's create a VM from that. Um, here's the command, just a second there. So uh, as I uh, shown, as I've shown, uh, you need to pass the infer instance type and for preference flags. Uh, then I'm telling it to use the data source I've just shown to you. And I want to, uh, wanted to name this VM Fedora. And all of this gets piped into kubectl I'll create. And as you can see, this was enough to create a virtual machine and it's called Fedora. So uh, let's wait for this VM to be ready. Uh, just a second. Um, so it's ready. And now let's have a look at the instance type and the preference of the VM. And you can see uh, it's using the N1 medium instance type and the Fedora preference. So the inference was successful and it's a full up and running VM. So the, the revision names, the controller revisions were also created uh, as well. And so there's one more thing left to do that is to have a look at the created VMI. Uh, I have another command for that. And we will have a look at the domain spec of the VMI. And as you can see, it has a CPU with one core. It has a Word IO disk, Word IO interface, uh, EFI is enabled, secure boot is enabled, and, has, and it has uh, four gigabytes of RAM. So all those settings were um, applied from the instance type and the preference. And those were inferred from the uh, data source we just used. So. Uh, if we go back to this uh, command there, this, this uh, is all we needed to create a full up and running VM. So I think that's that's very useful, very great feature. And uh, that's all for me. And back to Lee for the last slide. Cool. Thank you, Felix. Um, so yeah, in terms of what's coming next then. Um, so um, as I said, v1 beta 1 with qvert v1.0.0 next, uh, not 060. Um, we're going to be looking to add more flags to vert CTL, um, a few more use cases. Um, it's excellent already. And Felix's demo then was, was brilliant. But um, there's a few more things we'd like to cross off. Um, one key thing that we'd like to do is um, attempt to reduce the number of controller revisions that we're currently taking. Um, for simplicity's sake, for the initial implementation, we actually end up creating a controller revision per virtual machine and instance type or preference. Um, so we end up duplicating controller revisions with the same copy of an instance type or preference. So going forward, we'd like to do some kind of sharing. Um, ownership obviously gets a little bit complicated and um, just ensuring that 
there are no owners before deleting um, the final control revision becomes an issue. So yeah, hopefully we'll get that addressed with the V1 Beta 1 as well. Um, two new features that we'd like to look into, um, resource requirements are provided by preferences. So as I said before, Commonance and Stipes is currently targeting um, OS kind of level run, um, uh, uh, run times and workloads. Um, they obviously have resource requirements and we'd like to express them somehow uh, within preferences. Obviously applications also have those kind of requirements. Um, so there is actually a PR uh, that's quite well progressed upstream for that at the moment. So we're hoping to land that soon. Um, and then required attributes for preferences as well. Um, so at the moment, everything's preferred, the attributes that are available um, with that particular behavior. But for certain applications, there will be the, the need to kind of express you know, hard, fast, hard requirements for uh, particular attributes to be um, enabled, disabled, or with a particular value. Uh, so we're looking to looking to express that in preferences as well uh, with V1, V1. Uh, for V1 of the API, uh, with Qvert, um, the version after V1, <laughs> V1.1, um, we are in early discussions about potentially providing defaults uh, within Qvert upstream and what that would look like. Um, either through common instance types or through something that, that actually lives in the core Qvert repo. Um, that hasn't really been progressed. Um, it will probably end up in some kind of design document um, uh, towards the end of this cycle. Um, but yeah, we'd like to you know, provide some useful, meaningful starting points for users uh, in upstream Qvert. Um, so whatever that looks like in the future. And I think that is pretty much everything from us. Yes. Um, I do see we have questions. Um, are we good just to read off? Yeah, if you can answer them in approximately 60 seconds. Otherwise, what I can do is leave you as presenters. Uh, you can turn your mic and audio off and you can answer them using the reply button. And that way, everyone will still be able to see it. Uh, yeah, we can. Yeah, we'll just reply them if that's OK. Um, yeah, just to let you kind of set up for the next session. That's fine. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.